In our introduction to Mark, we discussed how the early Christian writers, they attested that this gospel is the faithful preservation of Peter's oral testimonies. This is an oral gospel. And the internal evidence found in Mark supports this, such as the vivid descriptive style and its focus on the actions and deeds of the ministry of Christ rather than lengthy teachings or parables. If you read Mark out loud, and you really should try this, you will see that it's an oral gospel. It's not a literary gospel. It's made for being read out loud. Yes, 97% of the accounts in Mark are found in either Matthew, Luke, or both. But those accounts are often longer and more detailed in Mark, and more descriptive and verbose and immersive. It's striking, captivating language, a campfire gospel. It does have an oral origin. This emphasis on the works and deeds of Yahshua and his ministry. They give the Gospel of Mark a fast-paced and dynamic narrative compared to the other accounts. You see the word immediately used over 40 times in this Gospel. Over 40 times. It keeps a fast pace. The other Gospels, they each begin with a prologue of some kind. Matthew and Luke, they both have genealogies and accounts of Yahshua Christ in his birth and infancy. John, he provides a detailed explanation that Yahshua Christ is Yahweh come in the flesh. But Mark has no such prologue. Rather, in Mark, it immediately opens right away with an account, a very short account, of John the Baptist, the most concise account of his ministry in all four Gospels. Then, from there, it quickly proceeds from John the Baptist to Yahshua Christ and his ministry. There is no account of his birth, no account of his infancy, not even any background, really, given on Yahshua. Really, Mark expects the reader to know who he is, and he immediately focuses on his works. This should not be surprising to us when we consider the background and the purpose of Mark's gospel. His goal, his purpose, was to faithfully write down what Peter preached orally. And this is what Mark did. We also suggested in our introduction to Mark that this gospel is written third. Matthew first, Luke second, Mark third, and of course, John fourth. As we said earlier, longer dialogues, genealogies, they're more suited for literary gospels. Those are difficult things to relate on the fly orally. <laughs> Genealogy, that's tricky. So Peter, he evidently gave less attention to them. And when we read Mark, and we'll be seeing this as we go through the gospel, we can conjecture that perhaps Peter Perhaps he tried to focus most primarily on what he himself witnessed. And that would align with Peter and his speaking style, as it's recorded in Acts. That's how Peter spoke in Acts. Therefore, the lack of an infancy account is exactly what we should expect to find. Peter wasn't there. He didn't witness it. And the very brief account of the temptation in the wilderness is also very telling. Peter wasn't there to witness the temptation. Peter, it seems, wants to focus on things he himself saw so that he can give a very vivid and captivating extemporaneous account. Throughout this commentary, we will be reading from the Christogenia New Testament, translated by our dear friend William Fink of Christogenia.org. This translation prioritizes the earliest surviving manuscripts. With all of this being said, let's get started on this gospel. Chapter 1, verse 1. And it reads, The beginning of the good message of Yahshua Christ, Son of Yahweh. What a wonderful way to begin this gospel. The word for beginning here is RK, which can also be interpreted as origin or source. And source here, 
That is probably the intention Mark had in mind, considering that this gospel is about to focus on the many wonderful works and deeds of Christ and his ministry. Those works, those deeds, they're the source of the gospel. And the accounts, the testimonies, the eyewitness testimonies of these events, of these deeds, they were spreading like wildfire at the time. They were flipping the society upside down. And Peter, he testified that he and the other apostles, they were eyewitnesses of all these things from the immersing of Johannes until the day Christ was taken up. Also, as Luke wrote at the beginning of his gospel, Just as they, who from the beginning, Arche, having been eyewitnesses and attendants of the word, transmitted them to us, transmitted those events, which are the source of the gospel. As for the gospel itself, the good message which the apostles transmitted is the good news of reconciliation for the children of Israel. And we discussed the scope and the purpose of the gospel in our recent presentation, the gospel for whom? The gospel for white Israel. An understanding of the scriptures reveals that the good message is by its very nature exclusive, as only the children of Israel were in need of redemption and reconciliation under the law. And as we explored in that video, only they could receive these things through the mechanics of the law. So, as we read here in verse 1, the beginning of the good message of Yahshua Christ, son of Yahweh. This is the beginning or source of that good message for the children of Israel. Starting with the ministry of John the Baptist, who prepared the people for Christ. We're going straight into John the Baptist now, and we'll be discussing in this video precisely how John the Baptist prepared the people, what that means, and how he did it. Verses 2 to 3, just as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who shall prepare your way. A voice crying out in the wilderness, Make ready the way of Yahweh, make straight his paths. It's not immediately obvious in the text, but these are actually two quotations, and they're conflated here into one. The first is from Malachi, even though they are both attributed to Isaiah in their earliest codices. The quote, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who shall prepare your way. That one is from Malachi 3.1. And the quote which follows it, a voice crying out in the wilderness, make ready the way of Yahweh, make straight his paths. That one is from Isaiah 43, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. So, there's a discrepancy here, or at least there seems to be. This apparent discrepancy was noted as early as Jerome, at least. And the Codex Alexandrinus apparently attempted to correct the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus by omitting the mention of Isaiah and writing prophets instead. The King James follows that reading, which isn't surprising, since the majority text often favors the Alexandrian tradition. So even when we look at the Septuagint and the Masoretic, why exactly Mark chose to attribute both these quotations to Isaiah, that's difficult to answer. And while Isaiah is excellently preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there doesn't appear to be anything in the surrounding passages that supports this attribution. There's nothing that I'm aware of in the Septuagint, Masoretic, or Dead Sea Scrolls of Isaiah that, um is similar to, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who shall prepare your way. As far as I know, that only appears in Malachi. So, perhaps, and this is possible, perhaps there are missing or corrupt passages common to all of the surviving Old Testament manuscripts. Perhaps Mark was quoting Isaiah here, 
and our copies of Isaiah are a little corrupt and we don't have that copy Mark had. Perhaps. But we won't rest our laurels on that conclusion. Neither is that conclusion really desirable. The minor prophets were often appended to longer scrolls so that the valuable space would be used most efficiently. You want to use up every inch of those scrolls. So, and if they, and if they didn't do this, then shorter prophetic works would wastefully take up entire scrolls. Imagine having an entire scroll for Obadiah. Imagine having an entire scroll for Haggai. It makes no sense. You have to be efficient. So the minor prophets were often appended to longer major prophets, such as Jeremiah. And some have suggested that Matthew's attribution of a prophecy found in Zechariah to Jeremiah may stem from the fact that Jeremiah often appeared first on these scrolls, and then the minor prophets, such as Zechariah, were appended to it afterwards. So, Matthew would have been saying, oh, as it's written in Jeremiah, because this is the scroll of Jeremiah, but the prophet Zechariah is appended to that scroll. So perhaps Matthew was referencing the scroll. It's possible. It's a good theory. And a similar explanation might resolve the apparent discrepancy here in Mark, assuming that some scrolls placed Isaiah before Jeremiah. So maybe he's referencing an Isaiah scroll. However, I'm not aware of any evidence in the ancient manuscripts that supports this specific ordering. So therefore, this explanation is only somewhat satisfactory. Though, there is another possibility. What is this one? Composite citation. This rhetorical device can be found in the literature of antiquity, where two or more sources are quoted, but only the more prolific or relevant source is actually named. An example of this can be found in the contemporary first century writer, Plutarch, where he wrote, As Demosthenes says, Stop the tongue, block up the mouth, choke people, and make them silent. That's sort of interesting. Be better than the bad, tis in your power. Plutarch, he attributes this statement to Demosthenes, but the second sentence is actually from Euripides. So the idea behind composite citations, it seems, is, is that through the merging of two or more quotations, a greater lesson or theme can be conveyed to the reader. And if this was Matthew and Mark's intent, we can conjecture that they were trying to illustrate the synergy of the scriptures, which a compounding of Isaiah with Malachi, for instance with Mark, or a compounding of Jeremiah with Zechariah with Matthew would certainly demonstrate. So perhaps they're trying to show the reader, look at the synergy between these accounts, between these prophecies. Look at how they compound. Maybe that was their intent. And Christ is also recorded as having composited the scriptures in a similar way. Maybe not in exactly the same way, but in a similar way. With all this being said, it's difficult to reach a decisive conclusion, because none of this can be definitively proven one way or another. We can't go back in time and know Mark and what his intent was. But, whatever the case may be, no man has any right to tamper with the text. So the later Byzantine manuscripts, they certainly do wrong by attempting to quote-unquote correct Mark. They shouldn't have done that. It's Isaiah in the earliest manuscripts, and that's how it is. That's what we have. With all of that out of the way, we can actually talk about the prophecies in question, and both of them certainly apply to John the Baptist. John the Baptist, he testified that he was the voice crying out in the wilderness. He testified that he was that voice in the Gospel of John. 
in Christ, he confirmed that John was this specific messenger spoken of in the prophet Malachi. In Christ, he confirmed this in Matthew and in Luke. So there's no question that these are referring to John the Baptist. Now, whenever the Old Testament is quoted, it is important for us to go back and examine the context of the prophet being quoted and see what the scriptures said as they are written to look at the context and our interpretation must be in harmony with that context. The writers of the New Testament, they were not ever contradicting those writings. They never once quoted them out of context. Not once. And if we do not understand why these passages are being quoted, if we don't understand why Paul is quoting this specific passage, if we don't understand why Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, James, Jude, Peter, if we don't understand why they're quoting these Old Testament prophecies, then we can't understand what they're writing themselves. We can't understand the point that they're trying to make, and we certainly can't understand the Bible. So we're going to go back, we're going to read both of these quotations in detail. And we'll begin with Malachi. So we'll read the quotation again. Just as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who shall prepare your way. This prophecy of Malachi is confirmed by Christ, as we said, to have been fulfilled in John the Baptist, Matthew 11, Luke 7. The specific quote is found at Malachi 3.1, but we'll read a little further. Malachi 3.1, as it is in the King James. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith Yahweh of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto Yahweh an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto Yahweh, as in the days of old, as in the former years, and as in former years. So we see two messengers here, the first one, and then the messenger of the covenant. And then when we see he being mentioned, he shall come, he is like a refiner's fire, he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, he shall purify the sons of Levi, it's not always the same he. We're actually switching back and forth between the messengers in a most fundamental sense. The first messenger is John the Baptist. And we know that from the quotation and from the context because he's preparing the way. John the Baptist prepared the way for the messenger of the covenant. Look here. Behold, I will send my messenger, John the Baptist, and he shall prepare the way before me. Before me. <laughs> and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. So that messenger of the covenant is who John the Baptist is preparing the way for. And that's also Yahweh because he says it's me. It also should be mentioned that the name of the prophet Malachi itself means messenger. And that is certainly descriptive of the book's major themes. Both Malachi and Isaiah, they describe this messenger, this voice in the wilderness, as preparing the way for Yahweh. Though they focus on different aspects of how this was accomplished. In Malachi, we see that to prepare the way, the first messenger was to quote, Purify the sons of Levi, so that, quote, they may offer unto Yahweh an offering in righteousness. This offering in righteousness was Yahshua Christ himself, 
as John the Baptist described, as the Lamb of Yahweh, as that is the only sacrifice which was pleasant to Yahweh in Malachi's future. As Paul wrote in his epistle to the Hebrews, saying above, sacrifices and offerings, and burnt offerings also for errors you have not desired, nor have you been pleased with, which are offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, Behold, I come that I will do your will. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. That he may establish the second. Okay, that's the new covenant. The covenant associated with the second messenger of Malachi, Yahshua Christ. Continuing with Paul. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second, in which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Yahshua Christ once for all. That offering is the offering in righteousness described in Malachi. Yahweh was not pleased with bulls and goats, but there's a pleasant righteousness in Malachi's future. Can't be bulls and goats. It's Yahshua Christ. And that's who John the Baptist prepared the people for. We see in Malachi that the sons of Levi would have to be purified before this offering of the body of Christ could be made, which must mean it is found in the law concerning such sacrifices. If it's a necessity, it must be in the law. So why do the Levites have to be purified before this offering can be made in righteousness? Christ himself said, he said, that he came to fulfill the law. Now, if we go to the law, we'll see that the priests, the Levites, were to wash their bodies before entering the temple for service and for sacrifice. Leviticus 8, 1-7 And Yahweh spoke unto Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments and the anointing oil, and the bullock for the sin offering, and two rams, and a basket of unleavened bread. And gather you all the congregation together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Moses did as Yahweh commanded him. And the assembly was gathered together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Moses said unto the congregation, This is the thing which Yahweh commanded to be done. And Moses brought Aaron, a Levite, like himself, and his sons, and washed them with water. And he put upon him the coat, and girded him with the girdle, and clothed him with the robe, and put the ephod upon him, and girded him with the curious girdle of the ephod, and bound it onto him therewith. They're washed with water. Numbers 8, 19-22 And I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and to his sons, from among the children of Israel, to do the service of the children of Israel in the tabernacle of the congregation, and to make an atonement for the children of Israel, that there be no plague among the children of Israel, when the children of Israel come near unto the sanctuary. That there be no plague, that's reminiscent of Malachi 4.6, and Malachi 4.6 is about the Elijah ministries. Moving forward. And Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel did to the Levites according unto all that Yahweh commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so did the children of Israel unto them. And the Levites were purified. There it is. And the Levites were purified. And they washed their clothes. And Aaron offered them as an offering before Yahweh. And Aaron made an atonement for them to cleanse them. And after that, went the Levites in to do their service in the tabernacle of the congregation before Aaron and before his sons. As Yahweh had commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so did they unto them. So those are two witnesses of the Levites having to be washed, purified, before going in to do service, so that they can offer 
offerings in righteousness. Aside from cleansings for those exposed to unclean substances or peculiar circumstances, these are the only mandated ritual cleansings in the law. And the passage in Numbers is the sole mention in the law of a purification for Levites. So it's the only direct cross-reference for this purification of Levites in Malachi. It can be seen in Luke's gospel that John the Baptist was himself a Levite, just like Moses before him. And both men were instructed by Yahweh to cleanse men with water. So, these laws were necessary for Christ to be an acceptable sacrifice to Yahweh God, as the Levites were required to be purified before they could lawfully give an offering. All of this was absolutely compulsory for Christ to be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, John said, In order that he would be made manifest to Israel, for this reason I came immersed in water. It was necessary for it to happen. We will now continue to the prophecy from Isaiah and see another aspect as to how John the Baptist was going to prepare the way. Verse 3 here. A voice crying out in the wilderness, Make ready the way of Yahweh, make straight his paths. This prophecy is quoted in reference to John the Baptist in all three synoptic gospels at Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, Mark 1, 3, and finally Luke 3, 4, who also cites the two verses which come afterwards in Isaiah. In addition, John the Baptist, he identified himself as this voice crying out in the wilderness, and he did so at John 1.23. The specific quote in question is from Isaiah 40, verse 3. And the citation here in Mark is near identical to how the clause is rendered in the Septuagint. Just as we did with Malachi before, we're going to go to Isaiah, we're going to read the context. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 to 5. The voice of him that cries in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of Yahweh, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of Yahweh shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of Yahweh has spoken it. Wherever we see Yahweh in capital letters, this signifies that the tetragrammaton Yahweh is present in the Hebrew, and the substitution for his name with the word Lord is never justified, ever. Therefore, it is plainly evident where it says, Prepare ye the way of Yahweh, that this is telling us that Yahshua Christ is Yahweh God. Just as it was evident where Yahweh said in Malachi that the messenger preparing the way before me. So in Isaiah, Christ is referred to with the tetragrammaton, Yahweh. Malachi, first person, prepare the way before me. Yahshua Christ is Yahweh in the flesh. The reference to the smoothing of the rough places and the straightening of the crooked ways is symbolic of the repentance and consequential obedience of the people. It is written later in the prophet Isaiah that the wrongdoers did not know the way of peace, but had, quote, made them crooked paths. But by turning these crooked paths straight, John the Baptist prepared the way for Christ and a highway for our God. It is not surprising that the Hebrew word for straight in Isaiah 40 verse 4 can be used in a figurative sense to refer to justice. And we see that in Psalm 45 6, Malachi 2 6. The Hebrew word is Strong's 4334. Another prophecy of this smoothing in the plains is found in Zechariah where we read Zechariah chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. Then he answered and spoke unto me, saying, 
This is the word of Yahweh unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith Yahweh of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with sheltings, crying grace, grace unto it. In this passage from Zechariah, the mountain symbolizes Zion, the children of Israel, while the headstone unmistakably refers to Christ, the chief cornerstone. Through the power of Yahweh's Spirit, the people were prepared and brought into obedience. Yahweh, He rots the works of men. And their obedience, their smooth ways, prepared the way for the headstone to come and fulfill its purpose and to provide the gift of grace to the nation, the gift of favor. Let's think about it this way. If there were no remnant of Israelites, repentant of their Pharisaical doctrine and ready to receive Christ, then no one would have accepted him at all. But because the people were willing, the Messianic 26th Psalm was fulfilled, where it is written, My foot stands in an even place. In the congregation will I bless Yahweh. And that's prophetic of Christ. And the language here is similar to Psalm 22, verse 22, which is quoted by Paul of Tarsus in reference to Christ at Hebrews 2.12. John the Baptist prepared the people for Christ, and then Christ came and his foot stood in an even place. We are seeing the same pattern today as the third ministry of Elijah. John the Baptist, he was the second ministry of Elijah, or the third. We are seeing the same pattern today as the third ministry of Elijah prepares and straightens those who are disenfranchised from the Pharisaical churches. Even many aspects of Isaiah 40 suggest a future fulfillment for us today. These prophecies in Isaiah 40, prepare ye the way of Yahweh, make straight his paths. If you read the chapter, there are far visions. There are aspects which have not been fulfilled. Isaiah 57.14 from the NASB translation. And it will be said, Build up, build up, prepare the way, remove every obstacle from the way of my people. Continuing with Mark, we will see the immediate fulfillment of these prophecies explained. Mark chapter 1 verses 4 to 5. Johannes the Baptist was in the desert proclaiming an immersion of repentance for a remission of errors. And all the land of Judea and all those in Jerusalem went out to him, and they were immersed by him in the river Jordan, acknowledging their errors. This marks the beginning of the narrative in the Gospel of Mark, with our journey starting alongside John the Baptist. We will read this description of John the Baptist and his mission and his accomplishments again, and we're going to see how, through the will of Yahweh, he truly embodied his role. He embodied it, as it was foretold by Isaiah and Malachi. Johannes the Baptist, the messenger from Malachi 3, was in the desert, the wilderness of Isaiah 40, proclaiming an immersion of repentance for a remission of errors, making straight his paths, smoothing the rough ways. And all the land of Judea and all those in Jerusalem went out to him, and they were immersed by him in the river Jordan, purifying the sons of Levi, acknowledging their errors, repenting, and through that repentance, making straight his paths, smoothening out the rough ways. With the people coming to John and acknowledging their errors, the rough and ragged Mount Zion was smoothed into a plain and prepared for the coming of Yahshua Christ. This would not have happened without a voice in the wilderness, as the voices of the Pharisees, their voices, in the cities and the villages were vainly teaching the traditions of their elders. 
If they were teaching the law, then there would have been no need for John the Baptist. Those who were disillusioned with the assembly halls would have sought refuge in the wilderness, as it was an ancient Israelite custom to pray by the rivers. We see this in Ezekiel. We see this in Daniel. We see it in Acts. And we are told here in Mark that many came to John from all the land of Judea and Jerusalem. So there were many disenfranchised people. It is evident, both in the Gospels and in Josephus, that John the Baptist was incredibly popular, enough so that many were persuaded that he was the Christ, something which he consistently denied. Luke's Gospel gives us a brief example of how all these people were able to acknowledge their errors and repent and become a smooth playing. Because John the Baptist, he gave them advice, advice which was in harmony with the spirit of the law, contrasting sharply with the Pharisees and their traditions of the elders. Traditions of their elders. So, we read in Luke chapter 3, verses 10 to 14. Then the crowd questioned him, John the Baptist, saying, So what should we do? And replying, he said to them, He having two shirts must share with he who has not, and he having food must do likewise. Then also the tax collectors came to be immersed, and they said to him, Teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, Do not exact any more than that which is appointed to you. So those who were soldiers also asked him, saying, And what should we do? And he said to them, You should not cause any agitation, nor make false accusations, and be satisfied with your provisions. That's how the people repented. They acknowledged their errors, and they were shown a better way, and they repented and became a smooth plane. Ostensibly, the Pharisees were not giving them advice like this. Of course not. Look at how Christ condemns them. And think of what it's like today. If the people would go to the Pharisees today, they would be told that the law is done away with, that Jesus broke all of his promises and came for everyone so he can commit adultery, that they should go and frolic with beasts after completing, of course, their compulsory rituals of salvation. John the Baptist, his advice was in line with the law. But the Pharisees, in their pretense, disregarded the weightier matters of the law so that they could appear righteous in their appearances. Because of the Pharisees and their disregard, many of the children of Israel stumbled at the stumbling stone alongside with them, just as the so-called churches have pulled men into committing wrongdoing today bringing men into their trap, encouraging men to worship the society and its supposed morals. But as James wrote in his lone epistle, Adulterers, do you not know that the love of society is hatred for Yahweh? And that's James chapter 4, verse 4. The Pharisees did not condemn certain grievous sins, which God hates, but society loves, such as race-mixing fornication, and neither do the churches of today. Instead, the Judaized Christians of today, they go around the desert and the sea, making proselytes just like the Pharisees before them. And then they wonder why they are torn to shreds by the very swine which they feed. We can't emphasize enough how John the Baptist and his ministry foreshadowed what is happening today with the third ministry of Elijah. As the churches refuse to teach the law, they refuse to teach the Bible, but instead teach men the traditions of their pagan church elders. There is nothing new under the sun, and the identical circumstances are a matter of prophecy. We should look at John the Baptist 
as an example of what we should be doing today. Continuing with Mark, verse 6. And Johannes was clothed in camel's hair, and a belt of skin around his loins, and eating locusts and wild honey. It is written in Canes that the messengers of Ahaziah described Elijah the Tishbite as being girt with a girdle of leather. And we read in 2 Canes chapter 1 verse 8, And they answered him, He was a hairy man, and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. John was the second Elijah ministry, as the messenger Gabriel and Christ himself confirmed. Every word of the Bible counts. So, we see here that Johannes, belt of skin around his loins. He's the second Elijah. The first Elijah also had a belt of skin around his loins. So it's pointing here in the text that John the Baptist is the second Elijah. It has been theorized by some scattered individuals that John did not eat literal locusts. Yeah, they're not appetizing. So some have theorized that perhaps he rather ate the so-called carob fruit or carob fruit. But there's, there's no evidence for this claim, which is mostly only upheld by pharisaical people who think that their ideas of vegetarianism provide them some sort of righteousness. But the law, the law disagrees with their philosophy. The Greek word here, hakris, clearly refers to the insect. And locusts are confirmed by Yahweh in his law to be permissible for us to eat, even if they are not appetizing. Leviticus chapter 11 verses 21 to 22 Yet these may you eat of every flying, creeping thing that goes upon all four, which have legs above their feet, the leap withal upon the earth, even these of them you may eat, the locust after his kind, and the bald locust after his kind, and the beetle after his kind, and the grasshopper after his kind. The wild honey here in Mark, is certainly literal as well, of course. But it won't hurt to mention that honey and milk are often types for spiritual sustenance. Spiritual sustenance which comes from a conformance to Yahweh in His words. Psalm 119.103 How sweet are your words unto my taste! Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Proverbs 16.24 Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and health to the bones. And all of Yahweh's words are pleasant. Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Moreover he said unto me, Son of man, eat that you find, eat this roll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and, I, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, Cause your belly to eat, and fill your bowels with this roll that I give you. And then I did eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. I also think this is um, perhaps part of what Yahweh meant when he said he was bringing them into a land of milk and honey. It was literally a land of milk and honey. Of course, it was an abundant, rich land. And the Israelites were not lactose intolerant like the Edomites are of today. But I also think it was perhaps prophetic of the fact that the children of Israel would receive many oracles from Yahweh and much of his word while they were in that land. So it was a land that was going to flow with milk and honey in the future. It's a conjecture. And, and Paul, Paul of Tarsus, he even compared the word of God to milk. It's sustenance. It, it's, um, it nurtures you. It helps you grow from an infant into an adult. It helps you become mature in your faith mature in your understanding. Back to Mark. John, his rough garment of camel hair, and his sustenance on locusts and honey, these things are representative of poverty and humility. In Christ, he compared John the Baptist's lifestyle to a period of mourning. Mourning, poverty, humility. 
He didn't come eating and feasting. He came fasting. Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 to 19. These are the words of Christ. But to what shall I compare this race? It is like children sitting in the markets, calling out to others things which say, We piped for you and you did not dance. We sang dirges and you did not mourn. For Johannes had come neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, the man is a glutton and a wine drinker, a friend of tax collectors and wrongdoers. And wisdom is justified by her works. Johannes, not eating, not drinking, camel's hair, a sustenance on locusts and honey. The children of Israel themselves were certainly in a mournful and spiritually impoverished state before Christ came. But John proclaimed words of hope, and we read as we continue here in Mark. Verse 7, And he proclaimed, saying, He who is more powerful than me comes after me, of whom I am not worthy, bending over to loosen the straps of his sandals. This saying of John the Baptist is recorded five times in the New Testament, once in each gospel, and then once also in Acts, where Paul is recorded as having quoted it while in Antioch of Pisidia. We could imagine that John the Baptist said this often, and that the quote became synonymous with his ministry. The purpose of John's ministry was to prepare the people for Christ. But in doing so, many began to speculate that he was the very Messiah which he was preparing them for. An instance of this is recorded in Luke 3, 15-16, where John responds to the curious crowds with the same statement recorded here in Mark. His response would have been impactful. As bending over to loosen the straps of a man's sandals would have been seen as a demeaning or even humiliating gesture reserved for servants or slaves. Yet John emphasizes that the one to come is so mighty and so exalted that even this humble act would be too great an honor for him to be worthy to perform. That is powerful language. Also, speaking of language, the language here in Mark's account is slightly more descriptive than the other Gospels, where the unique detail of bending over is mentioned. The Greek word is kupto, and only appears here in the New Testament, as its appearance in the spurious interpolation of the adulterous woman in John 8 should not be counted among the authentic scriptures. That's not the Bible. While this detail could be seen as unnecessary, To mention, in a more literary gospel, the unique detail is comfortably at home in Peter's consistently evocative oral account. This is verbose, descriptive language. So it's not surprising to see it here. Now, there is a clear implication where John describes the one whom he is preparing the people for as more powerful than himself. Since we have to remember, men are dust. We are all dust and we are but grasshoppers before the Almighty. When Cornelius fell at the feet of Peter and worshipped, Peter responded by saying, Stand up! I myself also am a man. Indeed, Yahshua came as one of the brethren and walked the earth as a son of Adam. So for him to be this powerful and this dignified, while also being a man, then he must be Yahweh God himself. Otherwise, John would be placing Yahshua in a position which only belongs to God. As it is written, I am Yahweh, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another. Isaiah 42.8 He coming from above is above all. He being from the earth is of the earth and speaks from of the earth. He coming from heaven is above all. John 3, 31. Yet despite being the God who furnished the stars and the earth, he whom is worthy of all praise and honor for all the ages, he would later wash the feet of his ambassadors. In doing this, he taught them 
that he who serves his brethren and makes himself least is greatest of all. That is a lesson which all Christians should learn and live as we serve one another, as we sacrifice our lives for the benefit of our kin. Yahshua was more powerful than all of us, and he humbled himself for our benefit. He who had everything deprived himself so that we would be enriched. Continuing with Mark, and John the Baptist says, verse 8, I have immersed you in water, but he shall immerse you in the Holy Spirit. This is a part of the previous statement, and the two thoughts are also joined together in Matthew 3.11 and Luke 3.16, both recording parts of this quote which were not recorded in Mark, where John the Baptist mentions that Christ will also have a warrior Messiah advent, where he will gather the chaff to his threshing floor, but the wheat into his barn. The winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will burn the chaff of unquenchable fire. That's in Matthew and Luke, but not here in Mark. We have discussed the purpose of John the Baptist in his ministry, that he was to prepare the people for Christ by smoothing the plains through repentance and purifying the sons of Levi with a water immersion. So, of course, there would be no more need for a water immersion after the completion of these tasks. It was meant, it was always meant, to begin and to end with John the Baptist. And here John himself gives witness of that fact. As our beloved sleeping brother, Clifton Emmeheiser, sleeping because he's with Christ right now, as he used to write in his essays, the book of Acts records a transition of understanding from the old to new covenant. Since the majority of the ambassadors were students of John the Baptist before following Christ, they retained their old wineskin of water immersion for a time, even though Christ testified to them that Johannes immersed in water, but you shall be immersed in the Holy Spirit after not many days hence. We have to remember, the ambassadors were ordinary, humble men just like us, and it took them time to understand the extent of Yahshua's words, and they understood them on Yahshua's timing, on Yahweh's timing. He decides when our eyes are opened. And when did that happen? The epiphany was gifted to Peter. It was a gift. It was gifted to Peter after he witnessed the household of Cornelius being immersed in the Holy Spirit. And Peter later reported to the brethren that upon seeing this, quote, I remembered the sayings of the prince as he spoke. Indeed, Johannes immersed in water, but you shall be immersed in the Holy Spirit. These events are recorded in Acts chapters 10 to 11. And from then on forward, there is no water immersion in the Bible. Yeah, we saw water immersion in the early chapters of Acts. But after this epiphany, after this revelation, no more water immersion. The ambassadors had transitioned in their understanding. But even after they transitioned in their understanding, the water immersion of John still remained popular among many other people. And those other people would require that the better way be exhibited to them. We see an example of this with Apollos. Acts chapter 18, verses 24 to 26. And a certain Judean named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, a learned man, arriving in Ephesus, who was capable in the writings. He was instructed in the way of the prince, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught precisely the things concerning Yahshua, knowing only, knowing only, the immersion of Johannes. And he began to speak openly in the assembly hall. And Priscilla and Aquila, hearing him, took him aside and more precisely exhibited the way of Yahweh to him. The way of Yahweh was the immersion of the Holy Spirit. And we see shortly afterwards in Acts 
that Paul, like the other ambassadors, had long understood this by now. Acts 19, verses 1 to 3. And it came to pass with Apollos being in Corinth, Paul had passed through the highlands to come down into Ephesus and finding certain students. Then he said to them, then said to them, So, believing, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they to him, Rather, we have not heard if there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, In what have you been immersed? And they said, In the immersion of Johannes. Paul did not see any legitimate immersion apart from the immersion of the Holy Spirit. And this is the context of his words to the Ephesians, where he wrote that there is one prince, one faith, one immersion. He did not write that there are two immersions. Understanding that his readers could become confused, Peter, Peter clarified that the immersion he spoke of was of the conscience and not of the body, writing, not a putting away of the filth of the flesh, which would be a water immersion, but a demand of a good conscience for Yahweh. And that's 1 Peter 3.21. So we see that Peter no longer, dis, no longer regarded a water immersion after his experience at the household of Cornelius. Paul didn't regard a water immersion. We see that in Acts. We see that in his epistles. And Priscilla and Aquila showed Apollos the better way, the immersion of the Holy Spirit. The transition from the old to the new covenant was a shift from rituals to selfless sacrifice and care for our kin. But the opponents of the ambassadors, they sought to enslave men through ritualism. And the ambassadors, they warned us often of their tactics. While these Judaizers couldn't subdue men with the old rituals, circumcision, the offerings of sacrifices, they did find it easy to deceive the people by transforming early Christian rituals, early Christian practices, transforming them into rigid rituals and rites. And by doing this, they exerted control over them. Thus, Catholicism was born. Even today, many argue that their holy tap water is stronger than the blood of Christ claiming that without their special sprinkling of state-fed sewage, there can be no salvation. In doing so, in spreading this lie, they conquer the minds of those who now believe that they are dependent on a man in a silly robe for their salvation. And those men in robes, they snatch away men's liberty in Christ, and they enslave them. These are the deeds of Nicolaitans, literally people conquerors, which Christ declares that he hates in his revelation. Christ hates the deeds of people conquerors. He came to give us liberty from the rituals. With all that being said, we can discuss something else here, and that's concerning the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit should not be confused with the spirit breathed into Adam. That's the Adamic spirit. And the Adamic spirit is passed on to Adam's descendants genetically. That's in 1 Corinthians 15. And if, you, and if you're a bastard, you're a broken sister, and you can't hold that spirit. So the Adamic spirit is inherent upon one's race and can never be lost through disobedience. You can't change your race. You can't lose the Adamic spirit. And through that Adamic spirit, we're resurrected. So all of Adam is resurrected. And we see that in the gospel as well. But I don't believe it's in Mark. So while you can never lose the Adamic spirit, you can lose the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is an expression of Yahweh's dwelling with men when they are obedient to him. 
And this is how Christ described it to his ambassadors. John 14, 22-23 Judah, not Iscariot, says to him, Prince, what comes to pass that you are going to make yourself manifest to us and not to society? Yahshua replied and said to him, If one would love me, he shall keep my word, and my father shall love him, and we shall come to him, and we shall make an abode with him. Christ would say concerning the Spirit, I shall not leave you fatherless. I come to you, expressing in one single statement that he is both Yahweh, the Father, and the Holy Spirit who comes. They are one, not three. As for losing the Holy Spirit through disobedience, we can see that in the Psalms where David writes, after taking the wife of Uriah the fearsome, Yahweh, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. And I can't quite remember where that is, but I'll put it on the screen. Continuing with Mark, verse 9. And it happened in those days that Yahshua had come from Nazareth of Galilee and was immersed in the Jordan by Johannes. Again, Mark contains no account of Yahshua's infancy. The summary of John the Baptist is notably brief compared to the other Gospels. And now, after only eight opening verses, the focus shifts to the ministry of Christ. There is no background given on Yahshua, as Mark's purpose was not to write a historical treatise on the Messiah, but to faithfully preserve Peter's oral testimonies in written form. Now, where the verse says here, and it happened in those days. That, that makes me uh, think of something that I want to bring up. It happened in those days. Those days. How long were those days? How long? How long was John the Baptist crying out in the wilderness? Well, there is a way to roughly determine how long John was crying out in the wilderness before Yahshua came to be immersed by him. John being a Levite, would have most likely adhered to the requirement for temple service found in Numbers chapter 4, which sets the age of 30 as a prerequisite. We can make this assumption since Christ testified that his body was a temple. And if we continue reading from where Malachi was quoted earlier in Mark, it says, And the Lord, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. So he comes to his temple, and John serves that temple. Therefore, if we assume that John the Baptist, if we assume that he adhered to the age requirement outlined in Numbers 4, and then follow that Christ began his ministry around the time of his 30th birthday, as we read in Luke, it would suggest that John began his ministry at most six months before Christ's immersion. Remember, John the Baptist was six months older than Christ. We know that from Luke's Gospel as well. If John can't start until he's 30, and then Christ is 30 when he's immersed, around his 30th birthday, then it seems that John was immersing men for around six months. Luke notes that Christ was immersed in the 15th year of the emperorship of Tiberius Caesar. Luke 3, verses 1 to 2. And that 15th year of the emperorship of Tiberius Caesar would have started in August or September. Depending on if one counts from the death of Augustus, which would have been August, or Tiberius's official confirmation by the Roman Senate, which would have been September. Earlier in the Gospel, we read that Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, we read that he served in the division of Abia, or Abia. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. Abia, a priestly division that typically served in late spring, and 
that Zechariah received the message of John's imminent conception at that time. So after the finishing of Zechariah's service, John would have been conceived around June. Yahshua's conception was announced to Miriam six months later, which would have been around December. If we assume that Elizabeth and Miriam both had full-length pregnancies, then John would have been born around April or May, and Christ would have been born around September. Yahshua's immersion was around his 30th birthday, as Luke 3.23 notes. Therefore, if Yahshua was born in September, then his immersion was in September of 28 AD, which would have been the beginning of the 15th year from Tiberius's official confirmation by the Roman Senate, fitting perfectly with the timeline provided in Luke's account. So, the date of Yahshua's immersion here is September of 28 AD, and John's ministry lasted at most six months before this time. The success of John the Baptist's ministry, despite its short duration, this attests to the support of Yahweh God, that he was sent by Yahweh God, and Yahweh God approved of his ministry, and he gave it the fruits thereof, and he blessed it, and he had it grow. As Paul noted, it is Yahweh who makes to grow. 1 Corinthians 3.7 Likewise, Paul's former teacher Gamaliel remarked about the acts of the ambassadors, saying, If this counsel or this work should be of men, it shall be broken up. But if it is from Yahweh, you shall not be able to break them up, lest then you are found fighting Yahweh. Acts 5, 38-39 John the Baptist, his ministry, was of Yahweh. And Christ himself said that John the Baptist was the greatest of the prophets. And of course, Christ was greater. Now there's a, something else. There's a unique detail here in Mark that can be discussed, which is where he notes that Yahshua came from Nazareth to be immersed. There is no evidence that Christ ever lived outside of Palestine, despite the theories put forth by some. And, and it's an old wineskin of British Israelism for many people. Luke records in his gospel that it was custom for Christ to read in the assembly hall of Nazareth during the Sabbath, suggesting that he was well respected in the community. Luke illustrated this earlier in his gospel, in its second chapter, where he wrote, And he, Christ at twelve years of age, and he descended with them and went to Nazareth, and was keeping himself subject to them. And his mother maintained all of these words in her heart. And Yahshua advanced in wisdom, and in stature, and in favor, before Yahweh and men. So he was a well-respected man in Nazareth, and he read during the Sabbaths. The people of Nazareth were very familiar with Yahshua and his family. It is important to note that Mark uniquely shows us in his gospel that Yahshua was known for his trade among the people of Nazareth. The other gospels they have, is this not Yahshua, the son of the craftsman? But in Mark we have, is this not the craftsman? So he was a carpenter as well. And we read, is this not the craftsman, the son of Maria, and the brother and brother of Jacobos, and Joseph, and Judah, and Simon? And are his brethren not here with us? And that's Mark 6.3. Now, in response to their being incredulous, Christ said in Mark, A prophet is not without honor except in his own fatherland. A statement that would be less meaningful if he had spent significant time elsewhere, such as at tin mines in Cornwall. For example, the reasons, the reason the people of Nazareth 
doubted Yahshua is because they thought they knew him very well. These accounts, they strongly suggest that Yahshua lived his earthly life in Palestine, and there is no credible evidence for the claims to the contrary. There is none. We must remain faithful solely to what the scriptures tell us concerning Yahshua and his life and remain immensely, immensely skeptical of everything else. There's nothing in the New Testament, in the Gospels, about Yahshua leaving Palestine. And I think there might even be a, a prophecy for that in Isaiah 41, where perhaps speaking of the second advent, it says, and he will tread the places where his feet did not go. Now, we'll mention one last thing here for this verse. There may be a type for Christ and his immersion in the Jordan found in the book of Joshua. Just as Paul wrote that Moses and those with him were immersed in the Red Sea, we can consider also that Joshua and those with him were later immersed in the Jordan when they went to settle the land of Canaan as the waters of the Jordan River were parted in much the same manner. Of course, Joshua Christ and Joshua son of Nun shared the same Hebrew name. Therefore, the first Joshua was immersed in the Jordan, and so was the second Joshua. And we read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2, And all up to Moses had immersed themselves in the cloud and in the sea. And then Joshua 3.15-17 to 17. And as they that bare the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bare the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan, for Jordan overflows all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city Adam, that is beside Saratan. And those that came down toward the Sea of the Plain, even the Salt Sea, failed and were cut off. So all the waters are being moved. And the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bare the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. Joshua and the people were immersed in the Jordan, and later, around 1,400 years later, so was Christ. Verse 10, And immediately upon ascending out of the water, he saw the heavens dividing, and the Spirit as a dove descending to him. When Christ ascends out of the water, Mark uses the word euthios, Immediately, it's first of 40 appearances in this fast-paced oral gospel. Furthermore, the unique description of the heavens dividing here in Mark, as opposed to opening in the other gospels, is the exact type of evocative language we would expect to find in Peter's oral account. As for this verse itself, as John the Baptist said, in order that he would be made manifest to Israel. For this reason I came immersing in water. Now, Yahshua is manifest to Israel, with two distinct witnesses during his immersion that he is the Messiah, that being the Spirit resting upon him, and the proclamation from heaven, which we'll see in the next verse. This is indeed the pinnacle moment of John the Baptist's ministry and the combination of everything which he prepared the people for. Through repentance, John the Baptist had made Zion's rugged path smooth and ready to receive Christ. And now that John the Baptist has fulfilled his course, his role will hereafter begin to fade. Just as he himself declared, it is necessary for him to be augmented and for me to be diminished. And that's John 3.30.
Now, we have already explored the significance of John purifying the Levites. But Christ himself was not a Levite, he was a Judahite. So why does he undergo immersion? Why? The answer lies in the very same prophecy of Malachi. And we read Malachi 3, verses 3 to 4. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto Yahweh an offering in righteousness. And then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto Yahweh, as in the days of old and as in former years. The Levites are purified first, and then they offer unto Yahweh an offering in righteousness, and that offering is the body of Christ. The sacrifice of Christ fulfilled the offerings, such as those for sin and peace, as well as being our Passover lamb. And for this offering to be pleasant and offered in righteousness, it would have to fulfill all of the necessary laws. And turning to the law, which Christ himself said that he came to fulfill, we see that it's written that a burnt offering has to be cleansed before it can be lawfully offered to Yahweh. And therefore, this water immersion of Christ was absolutely necessary to fulfill all righteousness. And we read Leviticus 1.13, But he shall wash, the priest, but he shall wash the inwards and the legs with water of the sacrifice. And the priest shall bring it all and burn it upon the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, of a sweet savor unto Yahweh. It is indeed righteousness to fulfill the law of Yahweh our God. Deuteronomy 6.25 and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before Yahweh our God as he has commanded us. Therefore, Yahshua said to John the Baptist, as it is recorded in Matthew's account, Matthew 3, 14 to 15, But Johannes prevented him, saying, I have need to be immersed by you, and you should come to me? Then responding, Yahshua said to him, Allow it for now, for thusly it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. Yahshua was that offering in righteousness, prophesied of in Malachi, and the sacrifice would have to be washed in order for it to be offered righteously. Thusly it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. The depth of Christ and his adherence to his laws regarding sacrifices and offerings is evident in his encounter with Mary Magdalene after his resurrection. When she saw her teacher alive, she was filled with joy and rushed towards him, but he stopped her, saying, You must not touch me, for not yet have I gone up to the Father. A sacrifice is not complete until it is entirely consumed in its essence, symbolized by the ascending smoke, rises to Yahweh as a pleasing aroma. Those touching a peace offering with profane hands would be cut off from the people. So it was very important that Mary Magdalene not touch him. Otherwise, she would have been cut off. Evidently, Christ had presented himself to Yahweh before his later interaction with the ambassadors when they grasped his wounds. Remember, he later appears to them and Thomas touches his wounds. He puts his finger in the imprint of the nails. It is evident that Yahshua had in some way presented himself to Yahweh before all of that occurred. What does that mean? What does that look like? We don't know. We don't know. Now, after using water to purify the offering of Yahshua's body in righteousness, Mark writes that John the Baptist, quote, saw the heavens dividing and the Spirit as a dove 
descending to him. We can read this in more detail from John the Baptist's very own testimony. And Johannes testified, saying that, I observed the Spirit descending as a dove from heaven, and it abode upon him, and I did not know him. But he who has sent me to immerse in water, he said to me, Upon whom you should see the Spirit descending and abiding upon him, it is he who immerses in the Holy Spirit. And have testified that he is the Son of Yahweh. The description of the Holy Spirit descending as a dove is often understood to mean that the Spirit took on the literal form of a dove as it descended upon Christ. However, there is no scriptural precedent for the Holy Spirit being represented with the physical manifestation of a dove, such as in the anointing of David by Samuel. We see no mention there. The Holy Spirit is just an expression of Yahweh's dwelling with man. It doesn't need to take on a physical form. The physical form here is for the, for the benefit of the people watching. In fact, the immersion of Christ is the only instance where a comparison to a dove is made. And as for when the ambassadors and those with them were immersed with the Holy Spirit during the first Christian Pentecost, the immersion at that time was made physically manifest with tons of fire and not with doves. So, perhaps the phrase, as a dove, in Matthew, Mark, and John, could be understood as a simile, emphasizing the gentle and peaceful manner of the Spirit's descent, rather than implying a physical manifestation as a dove, like a dove. It didn't descend upon Christ like an eagle swooping down to its prey, but like a dove. Luke's use of the word somaticus, where he writes that the Spirit descended bodily as a dove, does not contradict this interpretation. Rather, the statement would be interpreted as meaning that the Spirit was tangible, observable, and that's why John the Baptist saw it. It doesn't mean that it was bodily in the form of a dove, but that it descended bodily as a dove, like a dove. Its movement was as a dove, gentle and deliberate. The Synoptic Gospels are grounded in a strong oral tradition passed down by eyewitnesses, as we discussed in our introduction to Mark. We noted earlier that John the Baptist himself testified to seeing the Spirit descending as a dove, and it's possible that John's choice of simile became closely associated with the event among other eyewitnesses. Many, if not all, of the apostles were former students of John, after all, and by reiterating his language, by reiterating his choice of simile, they hearkened back to their former teacher's testimony. Christ described the Holy Spirit as an expression of God's union with man and not a distinct entity apart from himself, no. Therefore, the physical manifestation of the Spirit here is for the sake of those watching as a witness to them that Yahshua is the Christ. It was also a witness for John the Baptist's sake, for he was told by Yahweh that, quote, "...upon whom you should see the Spirit descending and abiding upon him, it is he who immerses in the Holy Spirit." The prophet Ezekiel, he watched the glory of Yahweh depart from the temple of Solomon. And now, John the Baptist observes it descend upon an even greater temple in the body of Christ, a much greater temple. The crowds witnessing this incredible event would recognize this as a sign that Yahshua is the Messiah, remembering the prophet Isaiah, where it is written, And the Spirit of Yahweh shall rest upon him. And also, later in the same book, Behold, 
my servant, whom I uphold, my elect, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the nations. And just as the physical manifestation of the Spirit descending on Yahshua as a dove was for the sake of the people watching, so is the proclamation which is about to follow for the sake of the people hearing. Verse 11, And a voice came from out of heaven, You are my beloved Son, in you I am satisfied. In his opening to the Gospel, Mark referred to Yahshua as the Son of Yahweh, and perhaps he was foreshadowing this revelation here. John the Baptist's testimony of this voice from heaven is recorded in the Apostle John's Gospel, and we just read it earlier, where he said, And I have seen and have testified that he is the Son of Yahweh. That's the voice from heaven that testified and that gave John this testimony. The voice from heaven is a witness for men that Yahshua is the Christ, as it evokes language, clear language, from the second psalm, where it is written. The second psalm, verses 6 to 8. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. Yahweh has said unto me, You are my son. This day have I begotten you. Ask of me, and I shall give you the nations for your inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. Therefore, when men such as Peter testified that Yahshua was the son of Yahweh, or when Yahshua's adversaries questioned if he was indeed the anointed son, they were hearkening back to the promise of the Messiah found in the second psalm. This psalm of David directly incorporates the word Messiah, Mashiach, Strong's number 4899. And it was a pillar of messianic understanding in Judea at the time. Because of its use of the Hebrew word for Messiah, most fundamentally. The second psalm is quoted by the apostles at Acts chapter 4, verses 25 to 26. And Christ, he quotes it in reference to himself in his revelation, chapter 2, verses 26 to 27. So we'll read an example here. Matthew 16, verse 16. And replying, Simon Petrus said, You are the anointed son of Yahweh who is living. The reference to Christ as the son of Yahweh is also related to the extraordinary circumstances of his birth. This is evident where Gabriel told Miriam that, quote, The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. For which also the Holy One being born shall be called Son of Yahweh. The only other man, the only other man, whose birth directly involved the intervention of Yahweh God was Adam, which is why Paul called Christ the last Adam. They are the only two men whose births, whose creation, well, in Adam he wasn't really born, he was created and his navel cord was not cut in that day. But their creations or births required the direct intervention of Yahweh God. However, during the three and a half years of the ministry of Christ, the people were unaware of the specifics of his birth. And he was widely thought to be the son of Joseph. And we see in the Gospel of John that they did not know that he was born in Bethlehem. They assumed he was always from Galilee. The circumstances of the virgin birth of Christ became widely known later. So it wasn't what the early followers of Yahshua had in mind when they made their proclamations in the gospel that he was the son of Yahweh. Instead, their declarations would have been grounded in the second psalm and also other prophecies, such as the one found in Isaiah, where it is written, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, 
and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And while it's possible that some were aware of Isaiah 7, and a virgin shall conceive, it's not quite clear how, if that was part of the messianic understanding at the time. And you don't see that language, son of Yahweh, there in that, in that chapter. So when they call him the son of Yahweh, they're referring to the second psalm and other prophecies, such as Isaiah, where it's written, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now, while this detail is not evident in Mark, Peter was called to follow Christ the day after his immersion, as it is recorded in John chapter 1, verses 35 to 42. This means he was not present to witness the immersion of Christ firsthand, which may explain the brevity of his retelling. In contrast, the apostles John, son of Zebedee, and Andrew, the brother of Peter, they were present when Christ came to be immersed, and they witnessed this, which is why John's account of these events is far more detailed. Yahweh willing, we will return to the Gospel of Mark shortly, where we'll explore Peter's encounter with Yahshua by the Sea of Galilee, his second calling. Thank you for watching. And praise Yahweh, the God of Israel.